Hi, I'm Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, why is the US government-run detention center at Guantanamo Bay still open? We explore why, years after 9-11, some people remain jailed at the facility despite never being charged with any crime. I'm Malika Bilal and we are now live on YouTube, so leave your comments in the chat for us to include in the conversation. This morning I watched President Obama talking about Gitmo, right? Guantanamo Bay, which by the way, which by the way, we are keeping open which we are keeping open. And we're going to load it up with some bad dudes, believe me. We're going to load it up. That was candidate Donald Trump speaking in 2016 about President Obama's plan to shut down the prison complex at Guantanamo Bay. In January of this year, President Trump reversed Obama's executive order to close the facility. He reiterated its importance to the so-called war on terror at the State of the Union address. Have a look. I am asking Congress to ensure that in the fight against ISIS and Al-Qaeda, we continue to have all necessary power to detain terrorists wherever we chase them down, wherever we find them. And in many cases, for them, it will now be Guantanamo Bay. In July, lawyers for eight Guantanamo inmates who have never been charged with a crime launched a case challenging their detention. Joining us now via Skype in New York is one of those lawyers. Pardis Cabriai is a senior attorney for the Center for Constitutional Rights. Also joining us right here in our studio, Siraj Hashmi is an editor with the Washington Examiner. Lawrence Korb, senior fellow for the Center for American Progress. He's also the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense. And in London, Mozam Beg is a former Guantanamo prisoner and now the director of Outreach for CAGE, an organization advocating for rights of people held unjustly in the war on terror. Hello, everybody. It's good to have you here. Pardis, this idea of who is left in Guantanamo Bay, if the public are not following this, if it's oh, ages since they've seen a headline, what would you tell them? Who's still there? Um, largely men who have been held for uh, over 16 years without charge. People that the United States has had that long to bring charges against if they have committed crimes or if they are true security threats, and it has not. Um, and men who can and should be released as a matter of um, security, as a matter of law, as a matter of morality. Mm. Um, so, in a uh, nutshell. Uh, Larry, Pardis mentioned that some have been there for 16 years. I think one of the um, biggest topics of conversation among our community when we told them we're doing this is what is the treatment like now? Because, of course, when you think of Guantanamo, a lot of people think of torture. So I, I want to read you two tweets here. Faz says, the conditions are in many ways harsher than those reserved for the most dangerous convicted criminals in the U.S. Windowless cells, no opportunity for human interaction. And another person who is actually a lawyer, Alka, says, as the UN Human Rights uh, reiterated in January that torture abounds at Gitmo and detainees should be released for treatment. Torture, is that something that is still going on to your knowledge? Unfortunately, it is. And I think the real problem is that nobody's paying attention to it anymore. When we first heard the stories of torture back during the Bush administration, Everybody was outraged uh, in the U.S. And, and around the world, but it's sort of fallen off the radar. There's only 40 prisoners left as opposed to like 800. We had almost 800 at, at one time. And the real problem is that this is, rather than stopping terrorism, it's creating it. Because it becomes a rallying cry for people who say, I ought to go against the United States because of what they're not doing or what they are doing in Guantanamo. How do you know that, Larry? How do you know it's a rallying cry? Well, I think the way you know it is if you monitor what these groups like ISIS or the remnants of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, this is something they bring up. Now, it's not the only thing, but the fact of the matter is that with this struggle against, you know, terrorists, we will only win when we convince people that what they're saying and why they want to go against us and our allies is the wrong thing to do. Yeah, and one of the things, uh, to kind of echo Larry's point, is that when focusing on terrorism and the detainees who have not, who have either served the full term, were charged, convicted, and are, are scheduled for release, you, the struggle is in the bureaucracy of government in trying to find detention facilities or even rehabilitation facilities that are able to take on those 
scheduled to be released detainees. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about in Washington about this concept of the deep state, you know, the, the overarching government, this bureaucracy. And there are many forces within the government that simply don't want to have these individuals released. Sure. Marizam, I want to play a little clip from a film called, a documentary film called The Confession. Uh, it talks about your story. Uh, at the beginning, it tells what happened to you and what it was like for you, because you've told your story so many times. I want to do it via this little bit of a trailer. So have a look at this. This is the beginning of the trailer for The Confession. So it was midnight. There was a knock on the door. They put a gun to my head. They hooded me and they shackled my hands behind my back. That was it. I woke up in Guantanamo. Moazim Beg from Birmingham, who was arrested by the CIA in Pakistan, is now being held at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Never been convicted of any crime. And then you hear about this bureaucracy, the paperwork, we don't know where to put people. This is 16 years later, Moazim. What do you have to add to uh, the situation in Gitmo right now? How do you see it? Well, some of the work that I've been doing with my organization, organization CAGE, um, has been documenting and speaking to a lot of the former prisoners around the world, incl including, uh, for example, a very close friend of mine, Shakar Armour, who was held there for 14 years without charge or trial. I was only held for three, so I'm a relative novice uh, in comparison to him. Right. And the first thing I have to say about what's, what's happened to these guys is... You know, there's all this issue about the definitions of torture that happened under the Bush administration, that if it wasn't organ failure or death, uh, according to the uh, most senior legal advisor to the government, then it wasn't um, torture. Uh, and then you had Obama coming along saying that even though we tortured some folks, um, that torture, those torturers would not be prosecuted. The United States did a, um, a Senate report on torture, which admitted, uh, bizarrely, that they tortured at least 119 people, no prosecutions. And that's why today you have a president who says, I believe torture works. I would waterboard and a lot more. I'm going to load up Guantanamo with more prisoners. And, um, uh, and so you've got this uh, return. In fact, you know, the Bush administration never said that we agree or, or, or would torture. They simply called it enhanced interrogation techniques. What you have today is an administration led by a man who says he would torture and continue and believes in torture. And the aspects of torture, of course, are all the physical uh, parts that, that, that we've repeated so many times. Mm. But the greatest torture is to be held without charge or trial for a crime that you haven't even been told uh, that you've committed. And in the midst of all of that, you've got the destroyed lives of people, those who've been returned and resettled. Of the, of, of, amongst those, I've found myself fortunate. I'm British, born and raised here. But there are people like the Uyghurs, for example, from eastern Turkestan in China, who've been sent to places like El Salvador, Palau, um, uh, you know, places in the Uruguay and, and places they have no connection to, no language skills, no ability to communicate, no history, no culture. And they're supposed to somehow pick up their lives and return to wives and children that have grown up without them, in some cases not even being able to recognize their sons. And there's, no, there's been no sense of redress in any way by the United States of America for these destroyed lives. So like Larry said, when these images and stories go back to other people, and groups like ISIS, they say, look what they did to these guys. That's the land of justice. That's the land of freedom, democracy. They have habeas corpus and Magna Carta as part of their constitution. But in reality, they also have Guantanamo. Mozan, i just asking a follow-up. Do you think the detainment of a lot of individuals who have either been connected in some way, shape, or form to a lot of these terrorist organizations do you think that their indefinite detainment pushes people who are even flirting on the lines of being on edge of you know, joining a group like ISIS? Do you think Guantanamo Bay is the, the, the tipping point for them that pushes them over the, the edge? This is a, good, a really good question. I like the question. Um, the first thing I would say, out of all the, the Guantanamo prisoners I've ever met, I've met, met hundreds since my release, um, I've not come across any, uh, perhaps one or two, uh, who support ISIS or the idea of ISIS. And that's because ISIS makes Al-Qaeda look relatively tame. Um, and the other thing is that what you have seen in Iraq, I've done it twice, I I've made appeals for hostages, including British and American hostages, to be released because I saw them dressed in orange jumpsuits. And they were threatening to, and did in some occasions, execute these men. 
Now, why did they dress them in orange? Um, that's not a natural color of prisoners in Iraq and, 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 and Afghanistan and so forth. The reason why was to show some kind of connection, some kind of tangible link between their cause and the cause of the prisoners in Guantanamo. So you're both right in saying that it has been a, a, a almost a cause celebre for some of these guys. Um, but it doesn't uh, detract from the fact that what you've got happening is something that, that hasn't stopped over 14 years, 15 years, 16 years. It's continued, it's proliferating. And with, uh, with, uh, um, with Trump saying he's going to keep Guantanamo open, that's the only next step is that ISIS prisoners will be sent to Guantanamo. And if that happens, you, you've just turned the clock back um, and learned nothing over the past 16 years. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, two former commandants of the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. General Krulak and Hoare, they wrote an op-ed saying exactly this, that this is hurting us. Now, these are Marines, okay, who have fought and died for the country, and they, they agree with that. And, and that's why... Aside from the moral thing, which is just abhorrent that we don't stick up for our own moral principles, the fact is it's hurting our security. And a lot of people that have been released, they're like in the UAE. We don't know where they are. What are they doing? What are they up to? So, I mean, it's, it, it, it's even worse than you would think, uh, you know, looking at the situation. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in um, a, a viewer comment. Um, this is from a teacher, a high school history teacher in San Diego, who wrote this piece for Teen Vogue. Take a look at my screen here. Guantanamo Bay explained. He writes, I think all Americans should know what our country has done and to whom. He sent us a video about what it is he tells his students about Guantanamo Bay. Some of them, many of them actually, who uh, were born after it, it, the detention center was set up and so therefore do not know about Guantanamo and have never heard of it. Here's what he told the stream. Even for most people who have heard of it, the images that come to mind are usually orange jumpsuits, barbed wire. Most people couldn't tell you the name of a single person who's kept there. Uh, it's, a, it's a dehumanizing place. I had the opportunity to meet two men, Lakta Boudia and Mustafa Idir, who were detained in Guantanamo, and who later established their innocence, won their freedom. And I make it a point, I think it's important that I share their stories, that I share their, even their, their pictures with my students. You know, at the end of the day, I would want them to, I want my students to think for themselves about our policy toward Guantanamo, what our policy ought to be. But I think it's important that they understand this isn't some abstract issue. Uh, what we're doing there, we're doing to actual human beings with actual families whose lives are being ripped apart. We, we need to pay attention to their stories. And because he wants to share their stories, he included two pictures he sent us of the people that he's worked with. Uh, this one, Lakdar Boumedine, and another person, Mustafa Adir, who were released. Um, but Pardis, I want to go to you, because in, in this attempt to make sure that Americans know what is happening uh, in their country and being done by their government, you are working on behalf of at least 11 men who are still detained. What are their stories? What do you want the world to know about them? Um, well, I wanted to say, just on the, you know, following up on the teacher's point, I think all the time about how the narrative about Guantanamo, despite everything we know and um, all the debates we've had, uh, you know, the, the government still largely controls the narrative about the men who remain. And that is because of Guantanamo as a remote prison, because of secrecy that still surrounds the prison, because of the fact that reporters who've been covering this for, dec for over a decade still cannot meet face to face with a single detainee or communicate with him in person. Um, every time I go to Guantanamo, the notes that I take in my meetings are censored and a filtered, a censored redacted version is what I can talk about publicly. So it, it's just a, it's a crucial point that it's not only dehumanizing, but the distance and the secrecy and the lack of access that still surrounds the prison has everything to do about with, with you know this narrative the government or proponents of Guantanamo, people who are in support of keeping it open and who talk about the men who who remain as the worst of the worst, how they are able to continue that narrative and how it's able to continue to take hold in the public. Um, because still in 2018, that kind of basic access to the men who remain is not there and their stories cannot get out. 
Um, and so it ends up being a debate between what the lawyers say and what the government's lawyers say, you know, what the defense lawyers say and, and, and the government, the government versus us. And in many cases, it's hard for us to win. Um, you know, the government's word trumps. It trumps in court often, and it trumps in the public. Um, so that's just a, it's a really crucial point to understand about where we are still in 2018. The men that I represent, I'll talk about some of them. One is a, a Yemeni man. He's 43. His name is Sharkawi al Haj. He's been in U.S. custody for over 16 years without charge. The government has had that long to determine if it has evidence that he committed a crime and charge him with it. It has not. He's someone the government will probably never, never charge. And according to its position in court, it would it believes it has the authority to hold him uh, perpetually, potentially for life without charge under this theory that the U.S. continues to be in the same armed conflict that it was 17 years ago at the time of his capture um, that extends worldwide, that extends to unspecified and constantly morphing new or new groups, new terrorist groups that didn't exist at the time of 9-11, mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with him, um, and that it can continue to, continue to hold him for as long as the fighting continues, which in its theory is when al-Qaeda or these terrorist groups surrender to the United States, which is totally unrealistic. I mean, the government's lawyers stood up in court, sure. we had oral argument on our challenge recently, last month, and the government's lawyers stood up in court and said, we could detain men at Guantanamo for a hundred years um, if we had to. We have that authority. Mm. Um, so that's the position it's taking. Um, for a man who made a decision 17 years ago when he was in his 20s to go to Afghanistan, who's never been alleged to have participated in any uh, actual violence, who's never been alleged to have carried a weapon, uh, fought against the United States or its allies, mm -hmm. but who could be, could, who is looking at life, a life sentence at Guantanamo without charge. Siraj, I'm thinking that part of the reason this is happening, because no outcry from the American public, right. um, and it's not a particularly big issue. It's not no. high on their list of priorities. Can you, can you explain that for our international audience? Right. So with respect to national security and where the Trump administration stands, they, they you know, come at it from a position of being very strong on national security and keeping a, a facility like Guantanamo Bay open is a, a symbol of that. There's a, a level of significance in rebuking the Obama administration agenda of trying to close it and keeping it open and trying to fill as many people with it as possible, whether they are charged with an actual crime or not. Uh, of course, you know, the Obama administration ran into a lot of red tape with respect to closing it because there were not many uh, U.S. prisons or any people that wanted them to be transferred to the Can United I States. Just remind people what happened to President Obama. There's a sure. little clip that we've got. And then you, you see him in 2013 and you see him in 2016. Have a look. The idea that we would still maintain forever uh, a group of individuals who have not been tried, that is contrary to who we are, it is contrary to our interests, and it needs to stop. It is true that I have not been able to close the darn thing because of the congressional restrictions that have been placed on us. Admission of failure right, right there. Right. So people are being detained, there's no trial, people who are cleared, who knows when they're going to get out. How do you fix that? Well, there are a number of different ways. Of course, the, the chief re area that you can look at is simply voting. Uh, if you don't like the people who are in power, you can vote to change you know, congressional elections, Senate, uh, as well as the president. And with respect to you know, the kind of the bureaucracy that exists in Washington, uh, you, you have to try to force, not force, but encourage the next administration that comes into put people who are passionate about those issues because it's not always about the presence. The president can always be the figurehead who has the vision, mm -hmm. but it's the people in the executive branch who carry out that policy, and that's the most important part. And you know what I think is very critical? <clears throat> it, we, the people, are partly to blame because our members of Congress wouldn't let Obama do what he wanted. And when we tried to transfer some of these folks to American prisons, the communities got all, all upset. So it's not, you know, I think as a country, we have to, you know, get our act together. And I think it would be wonderful if this would be an issue in the next election that people would talk about and say, put me in there and I'm going to fix this problem so more Americans are not going to get killed. The, the reason, though, it won't ever become a, a primary reason is because if you look at the politics of it, if you are, 
if you are for closing Guantanamo Bay, that can put you in the camp of being a terrorist sympathizer. That, it's just as easy as that. Really? Oh, for sure. Which so is just the way that American politi political messaging works. I, 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 I think that, that because really, I, I want to bring up this viewer comment. Um, actually, not a viewer comment. This is someone who tweeted back to you, Pardis, and, and, and one of your organization's tweets. Uh, Queen Antiope says, well, those are terrorists, and they should be locked up for life. But we got a viewer comment from someone who spoke on that. Alka, the, the lawyer, says the biggest challenge is that we successfully convinced most of the U.S. and the world that the 800 were all terrorists when most were sold for bounty and trying to re-educate now, which no administration has actually done, is near impossible. And, and before you answer that, I, I just wanted to share this uh, viewer comment of someone who's watching the show uh, live and sent this in. He's a, a former detainee, Adaifi. He says, in fact, we haven't escaped Guantanamo yet. I was moved from Guantanamo to another one and worse. He was held from 2002 to 2016 and is now in Serbia. Uh, but Pardis, I know you wanted to comment yeah. on that earlier tweet. Um, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, in terms of, you know, they're all terrorists, I would ask that viewer to ask the question to herself, what actually does she know about the men who are detained there or frankly, those who've been released, it doesn't come from the government's mouth. Um, from, you know, spokespeople for keeping Guantanamo open. Um, has she ever had real exposure? Has she been able to hear the other side of the story fully uncensored? No. I mean, the answer is no to those questions. Um, in terms of breaking down the, the population right now, of the 40 men who remain, 31 have never been charged with a crime. Um, they are being held for alleged conduct that they did you know, 17 years ago at the time of capture. The only evidence the government has ever had to show to justify their detention is um, is only the amount of evidence that you would need to prove a breach of contract case, a negligence case. We're talking about incarceration and life imprisonment. And the standard of evidence the government has been held to, to had, has been held to is one of the lowest that exists in the law. Um, Five of the men who remain have been cleared for transfer by the government itself. That's important to understand what that means. That means that every government agency, government agency, not defense mm -hmm. lawyers, with a stake in these detentions, has gotten together, looked at the government's information about these people, and determined that their continued detention is not necessary for U.S. national security. Pardis, uh, Pardis basically, you are taking the Trump administration to court over this. Okay. How confident do you feel that the judges will, will say you have a good case? I feel confident in our legal position, mm. which is that um, indefinite detention without charge, and in particular on the standard of evidence that the government has been held to, is entirely novel and unprecedented mm. in, uh, in terms of U.S. law, and it's prohibited by international law. So I feel very confident in the legal positions we're taking. Sure. Um, I think it remains to be seen. You okay. know, I don't know how the judge will decide. Um, we thought when we brought our first Guantanamo case in 2004 or 2002 on behalf of detainees at that time, right after 9-11, that we had very little chance, and we, and we won. Right. I think the courts are our chance. I agree also with Larry that the public needs to care. It is... Mm. There is pressure that people can exert on their members of Congress um, that matters. And I think it is, it's hard in this time of crisis everywhere under President Trump to, to pay attention to Guantanamo. But there is, it's crucial to remember that public pressure still matters. All right, Pardis, I, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Public pressure still matters. Malika, what's going on online? I will end with this tweet from Lauren, who says, above all, Guantanamo's existence cannot become an accepted fact. Anyone who believes in fair trial rights needs to keep themselves informed as to what's happening. We can't turn a blind eye. Siraj and Larry and Pardis and Mozam, it's, it's really good to have you on this program. I feel that there's so much more to be said about Guantanamo and it will, in history, when we look back at this time, uh, people will be questioning what happened um, and what potentially went wrong. But for now, we're going to wrap up the show. Thank you very much for being part of the stream. We appreciate your time. Today's discussion can continue online, so go to at AJ Stream on Twitter, and you can follow our Twitter thread right there. Malika and I will see you online. Thanks for watching.